Hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to Scrum Pulse. My name is Ravi Verma. I will be your moderator today. Really excited about today's session. The title is Transparency in the Trenches. And we have the most inspiring and passionate speakers that I've ever uh, met, uh, Dan Sloan. Before we get started, I want to tell you guys a little bit about what Scrum Pulse is. So this is a free monthly webinar facilitated by Scrum.org. Uh, this is completely community driven so we pick the topics that you guys recommend and vote on so you can register and suggest topics at scrum.org slash scrumpulse and if for some reason you cannot attend or you want to share it with some friends um, who couldn't make it live we make the recordings available on YouTube so we've got a YouTube channel scrum.org we'd love for you to subscribe and check in once in a while there is one unifying thread that you know, runs across all of our sessions. Our goal with the Scrum Pulse series is to restore the focus on empiricism and agility um, in the world of software development. And through these series of conversations and guided inquiries, we want to help our community deliver a continuous stream of value to our business clients and partners. And last but not the least, we want to help build trust and respect between business and IT parts of the organization some guidelines your microphones are going to be muted throughout this webinar however we would love to interact with you to see what's going on you know going through your minds questions and your comments many options for a couple of options for you to share your feedback you can tweet your questions be sure to mention the handle at scrum.org and put a hashtag scrum pulse and also you'll notice on your go to webinar panel there is a chat window and you can type in your questions and comments there as well we are going to be monitoring both feeds and at the appropriate time uh, we will be sharing those questions with our speaker Dan Sloan um, and getting his feedback. So with that I'd like to introduce you to Dan Sloan. He's our speaker today. Uh, Dan, please uh, take a few minutes to introduce yourself and then let's dive in. Thank you. Sounds good. Ravi, thank you very much for the introduction and, and everyone greetings. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So really appreciate everyone taking some time and look forward to give you, everyone a good, uh, a good topic on transparency today. So a little bit about me. My name is Dan Sloan. Uh, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia here in the U.S. Um, I'm a founding partner of a company called the Madison Henry Group. Uh, I'm an enterprise agile coach with Madison Henry and I'm also a professional scrum trainer and evidence-based management consultant with scrum.org. Uh, I've been in the software development profession uh, almost 21 years now. I cut my teeth uh, as a developer, a business analyst. I worked in QA. I spent time as a project manager, a program manager, a product manager. So I've served uh, many disciplines within software development and really understand this profession pretty well. Um, about 10 years ago, I made the transition from a, a project manager to more of an agile coach and, and now of course agile trainer. So I've been through that transition, uh, really focused on the mindset and, and this is what I live and breathe every day for a living. So I, I love this stuff and enjoy working with organizations and also taking the opportunity to speak about topics that, that resonate with others. Um, so let's dive in today. We're going to talk about transparency. Um, so three things for today. First, I'm going to introduce a, a few definitions of transparency, draw from a few sources, uh, just to ground all of us in terms of, of what transparency means on the surface. Then we're going to dive in and look at a case study of an actual multi-scrum team, globally distributed effort, uh, a number of struggles that they were having with transparency, and, and I'm going to to share with you some of the things that happened and some of the things they did to start promoting transparency within this large group, uh, which ultimately helped them to start to realize the benefits of, of Agile and Scrum. So we're going to go into this into an interesting bit of detail. I'm going to share some artifacts, behaviors, uh, some stuff here is a little bit surprising and even extreme, but uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's a really good, real situation to learn from. Uh, we'll summarize. Um, what we've learned along the way uh, toward the end, and then we'll leave some time at the end of our talk today for some Q&A. Okay, well, let's, let's dive in. So for those of you that are familiar with Scrum, 
you know, let's say you're using Scrum in your organization. Um, as you know, an effective implementation of Scrum is built on a foundation based on these three pillars. Uh, these have to be functioning very well to optimize the use of Scrum within your organization. Inspection, adaptation, and transparency. So we talk about inspecting things within the Scrum framework, like inspecting uh, the sprint backlog, um, to inspect our progress as a, scr uh, as a Scrum development team. Um, inspecting the increment of software, for example, to adapt uh, what we work on next in our product backlog. Um, inspecting things in Scrum in order to make the adaptations we need to optimize the outcome of our work and the value of the product that we work on. For inspection and adaptation to be effective, the things that you do inspect have to be done transparently so that the people that are inspecting things in Scrum have a common understanding of what they're looking at. Um, a few questions to help you understand transparency within teams. What are we looking at? What's going on? Could be a, a question about a, a challenge or an opportunity uh, surfaced in a Scrum retrospective. Um, sometimes I'll see uh, uh, teams ask questions like, well, what's, what's actually happening? but then they'll insert the word really in there. So what is really happening? And that can be an interesting way to surface questions within teams where transparency could be a challenge. So think about these three pillars of Scrum. We're going to come back to these uh, off and on throughout the talk. So let's draw from a couple of sources on the meaning of transparency. The first is from the publicly available Scrum Guide, uh, recently moved and released on uh, the scrumguides.org website, so I encourage you to go there and download a copy if you haven't before. Uh, there is a snippet from the Scrum Guide about uh, transparency, uh, um, transparency being that common standard that people use when they inspect something. So an example of that in Scrum would be, say, using the definition of done when a Scrum team and its stakeholders inspect the increment of software. A great example of that. So our common understanding of what we're looking at is the definition of done. That way we all know what's done and what's not done. There's no, and there are no questions about that. Everybody knows what they're looking at, transparency. Um, so there are lots of aspects, as you see the word aspects there, to Scrum and where transparency applies. Um, another definition to draw from is right out of wikipedia.org. And this is more of a behavioral definition of transparency. So look at some of the words in there. Openness, communication, accountability. So when you think of it from a behavioral perspective, transparency is when people and groups of people are operating in a way that makes it very easy for all of us to see what everybody else is doing, what actions are being performed, and it's all very open. If you think about this from the standpoint of organizational culture, the way people behave and when they feel comfortable behaving transparently, it very much depends on how those people feel within those organizations. Are they in environments where they feel safe and trusted so that they can be transparent, open, and honest? Transparency. Uh, here is more pragmatic statements of transparency. This is hot off the presses from Jeff Sutherland's latest book uh, that just came out today, um, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. And so I have an excerpt from his, his book that talks about things like sales teams in organizations. So transparency, for example, is when a sales team knows what features are being worked on, on, on the software products so they can market them. Uh, transparency is when leadership within an organization has an idea of where the money is going to come from. How, how, how are we looking to generate revenue or create value in our product? What do we think might be possible, the art of the possible, in Agile terms? Uh, the key message is that everything is being done in the open. That is right out of, right out of Jeff's book. Anyone can see where your product is at any time. That's good pragmatic statements about transparency within organizations. But as you will see, and perhaps others on the webinar have seen, 
transparency is one of the biggest challenges we run into in organizations today. A very simple analogy for transparency. So this is a, a screenshot of the actual uh, thermostat control unit in the upstairs of my house. So back in the summer when it gets really hot here in Atlanta, I tried to set my upstairs to an even 68 degrees Fahrenheit, but the air conditioner was not turning on. So we call a service person. That person comes in, goes to the attic and looks and finds out that sure enough, the sensor that is measuring the temperature is iced over. So when the sensor is covered in ice, it's going gonna, it's gonna to register a temperature that is much colder than it actually is. So the systems that drive the unit are not going to adapt correctly because the sensor's uh, reading of temperature is not transparent. So a great example of that. So when you fix the sensor and, and remove that veil, then the sensor becomes more transparent. These systems can make the proper adaptations because what they're inspecting is fully transparent. Kind of an interesting analogy here to uh, transparency and the pillars of empiricism in Scrum. So pretty prevalent Dilbert comic here. Uh, I know a lot of folks have probably seen this. Have you ever been in a situation like this before? Uh, it's, it's not an easy one. And, and I've been there. I've been on projects that played out a lot like you see uh, in this comic, where you know those of us in the trenches uh, can chat at the water cooler or the coffee maker, and we feel safe to be open and honest about whether things are going well or not. Um, as you can see, Dilbert here at the beginning of the of the of the clip. Um, but in certain environments you know, management or leadership or stakeholders would ask the very same question of those very same people and get an answer that's not transparent. Um, and we all know that if you're in a really challenging situation, uh, we say this a lot, bad news does not get better with time. So we have to be put in environments where we can go ahead and deliver challenging news much sooner so we can understand it for what it is and make the changes and adaptations needed to optimize the outcome of what we're doing. So one of the questions for everybody is what drives this behavior in organizations? How can we address the root causes that drive this behavior in organizations in order to promote transparency in organizations? So transparency. So let's, let's look at a case study for a little bit. And I'm going to set the stage here for you all um, as we dive into some of the details here. So first off, uh, the anecdotes I will share with you, these, this is a multi-scrum team globally distributed effort. These are real teams of real people working on really complex stuff. And, uh, and that's where scrums are great fit, right? Complex software development work. Um, they're working on really interesting complex software development. Um, I had an opportunity to provide some observation and coaching for this group along the way. Um, and I will say in my career as a coach, these are some of the smartest, most skilled and experienced people I've worked with. Um, and despite those skills and experience, they were struggling. They were struggling, but it wasn't because they didn't have the skills, and it wasn't because they didn't have the experience, and it wasn't because they weren't good, intelligent people. And it also wasn't because they didn't want to be successful. The teams I'm going to talk about here genuinely are trying to do their best. They are trying to figure out why they're not able to be successful and why they are having so much trouble getting valuable product into the market for customers. They genuinely want to do their best. So with that context in mind, let's dive in. So here's the situation. So what we have here is a globally distributed and dispersed group of, of, of scrum teams. This was an effort that had been going on for uh, at least 18 months previously. Uh, they had been unable to get any working product into uh, the market for their customers, so they started to learn about Scrum and felt that Scrum would be a better way to try and get product into the market faster. Sounds like a great idea, no question. So they started implementing Scrum within these groups, and the way it played out was they had multiple Scrum teams. Um, each of these Scrum teams was distributed, meaning that they were in different physical locations all over the globe from Eastern Asia all the way through to the West Coast of the United States. 
But not only were each of those teams distributed, but within each of those teams they were dispersed, meaning that the single team itself, everybody was working in a, a different physical location. Most of the people on this entire endeavor were all working from home including myself. Um, I came in and had an opportunity to observe for a bit, and this was all over phone and conference calls. There was no, you know, central hub or, you know, uh, a mission control center for this initiative. So you had multiple scrum teams, you know, attempting to do work and collaborate. You had a number of supporting players here in the middle. Uh, there was a, you know, a PMO organization to help with the governance aspects and to help, you know, deal with organizational impediments. Uh, there were leads. Um, within these different groups, not necessarily part of the scrum teams, but were outside those scrum teams to provide support for skills and niches for things like UI UX, or user experience, or offshore quality assurance and QA. And, uh, there were even some developers who actually worked on it, the product, who weren't at, on any scrum teams at all. So that was kind of an interesting situation that had developed with this group. And then the Scrum product owner had multiple what they called domain experts. So they had multiple supporting players to help that product owner scale and provide domain and subject matter expertise. And then you had a fairly broad and diverse stakeholder group across this organization um, who obviously had a great deal of responsibility and accountability to get product in the market. They were responsible for generating revenue. Uh, 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 getting new customers, retaining existing customers, so it was all very important for them. And so as this group had unfolded with Scrum, the stakeholders had freed up some budget for tools and said, okay, Scrum teams, we have budget to give you the tools and the technologies you need to be successful. What can we give you to help you? So these teams uh, went to the stakeholders and said, here's what we need. So they, they got Citrix GoToMeeting, kind of like what we're using today for the webinar. Uh, to do screen sharing and audio and things like that. Uh, they, everybody had a, an MSDN universal subscription to, um, uh, to Microsoft tools. So everyone was using Visual Studio and Team Foundation Server and all the, the tools and the capabilities that that ALM suite has to offer, like continuous integration and automated testing frameworks and things like that. Uh, because they were globally distributed and dispersed, they relied a lot on chat rooms online, so they used a tool called Campfire to create a chat room where they could have very informal uh, chat conversations and things like that. But despite all of those tools and technologies that, that they had, uh, they did have one that was their favorite, and it wasn't any of the ones that I showed you there. It was this, the infamous mute button. Very, very puzzling, um, and it created a lot of tension within these groups. I, I uh, Early in my tenure here, I had sat in on a meeting with uh, a member of the PMO and one of the developers. Uh, it was, the meeting had very good intentions. Uh, this project manager was trying to help the development teams um, and met with this developer to try to get a feel for progress and you know, what was going well and uh, where maybe some of the issues were. Um, but as this project manager was asking questions, uh, there was nothing in return. Um, Hey, Johnny, uh, what's the status of X, and how can I help you with this? Johnny, are you there? Johnny? John, oh, hey, I, sorry, I'm here. I'm here. Um, I had you on mute. Um, what I meant to say was, you know, we could use, well, Johnny, hold on. You didn't finish your sentence yet because you just put me back on mute again, and I'm trying to, you know, understand how I can help you. Um, it created a lot of tension. That, that was the kind of interaction we were seeing across these globally distributed boundaries. Uh, the mute button created a lot of tension within these groups. Uh, on the right is an example of the actual chat room uh, over five hours of, of conversation. Um, uh, this was the campfire chat room. Everybody's in here. De multiple scrum teams. You have developers, uh, product owner, product owner support people, uh, stakeholders would come in and out. Um, but what's going on in that room? I, you know, I'm not sure. It, uh, when I first came in, I mean, it's, there's nothing. It's blank. Uh, so I was very puzzled. So I spent a little time kind of getting to know the groups for a little bit, and, and some of the development teams came to me and said, hey, we have a, a tool we want to show you, but if, if you would please keep this confidential, we'll let you come in and check it out. And so what was actually happening was the Scrum teams had created their own 
private chat rooms on the left. Nobody else was aware of them except for the Scrum team. So on the right was five hours of, of conversation. And, and on the left, over that five hours, was about 15 to 20 minutes of conversation. There's all kinds of great stuff going on on the left. But what's happening in, in this situation? What do you all make of this? Zero transparency on the right. A lot of transparency on the left. Why? Um, you know, these teams on the right, they, they didn't feel safe. Uh, another example was their daily scrums. And, and what I had learned when I came in was that um, the teams had learned about the importance of daily scrum and inspecting your progress, etc. cetera. Um, and so the stakeholders, who were clearly under a lot of pressure, had, had talked to the teams and said, that, that makes sense. We want to give you all the space you need to inspect your progress transparently so we can help you all. Um, can you can you please keep a log of, of everything that's talked about in the daily scrum and you know write your impediments in there and things like that and let's make that available and visible and transparent so we, we can be there to help you um, uh, the development teams um, initially were, were not completely comfortable with that and they had expressed that um, uh, but stakeholders were, were very adamant that we, we really could use this log uh, we really do want to know what's going on with your progress and we can use that log to help um, so in response to that Scrum teams created these logs, um, and they put them in Excel spreadsheets. But it was interesting. This was the statement that they collaborated on and wrote uh, in red at the top of their spreadsheet. Um, what, what do you all make of this? And what does this tell you about transparency between stakeholders and leadership and the teams in the trenches. You know, many challenges with transparency in this environment, in this situation. Uh, it's a very difficult statement to understand. Um, their retrospective, as I had come in, had a chance to observe one of their retrospectives, um, and it was run completely over a conference call. Um, and so the Scrum Master that was facilitating this had really, really good intentions for uh, these scrum teams, uh, put a lot of preparation in and came into the retrospective and had pre-developed a ranking to help the scrum development teams. Here's a ranking of each developer and the number of story points that that developer had got done in the sprint. I'm going I'm to rank each person to help everybody understand uh, individual level performance and how to improve. So this person had great intention with, with the fun facts uh, 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 mailing that went out for the retrospective and would kick off the retrospective with the, the very basic, okay, what went well this sprint? Mute. Um, hello, is there anyone there? Um, I, I think you guys did a great job this sprint. I mean, the teamwork's getting better. Um, uh, you're using the tools. Uh, uh, what, what didn't go well so, go so well this sprint and what can we do to improve? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, Johnny, anything to add? Well, oh, okay. Um, so um, here are the things that I, that I think didn't go so well, and, and um, uh, I, I've spent some time. I've already analyzed, you know, the story points for the sprint and done the ranking. Um, here's a list of ten things that. I think you all can do to improve your performance in the next sprint, and I'll go ahead and put it in the product backlog for you all. So very good intentions from the Scrum Master, but creating a, obviously a very challenging environment in this retrospective. So with the mute button on, what was actually happening in this retrospective was, was a very interesting behavior. Um, the Scrum development teams had created their own private chat room for the retrospective, and that Scrum Master was, was not in that room. So while they're on mute here on the left, on the right, they're actually having the conversations they need to learn from the sprint and to inspect the scrum team and the processes and the relationships and the tools and the practices that they're using in an effort to come up with the actionable ideas and improvement items that they can look to, to, to do in the next sprint to help improve the way we do what we do. But all of those ideas were happening in secret without any awareness for this Scrum Master, uh, obviously a very challenging situation. 
not very transparent. So what do you make of that? Transparency. A lot of, a lot of really challenging situations. So a common theme as we're seeing here, so how in, in, in challenging situations like these in organizations, how do we go from the upper left where say you're, say you're a leader of, of an IT organization but you don't feel you have the trust of your teams or maybe it's on the, uh, the converse side where teams don't feel that the leaders trust them and it creates a lot of tension and, and doesn't promote the transparency needed to be open and honest. How do you go from that environment and those behaviors in the upper left to the environment needed to promote the behaviors uh, as stated right out of the Agile Manifesto? Uh, we talk about building environments around motivated, you know, good skilled people. Let's give them the environment and, and the support that they need so we can trust them to get the job done. Um, building that trust in some organizations can be very, very challenging. So how do we do that? And what were some of the things that happened in this multi-scrum team globally distributed effort to help move them in this direction? So what comes first in a situation like this? Transparency or trust? And I, this comes out of a, a really good book on, on kind of the next generation of management. It's called Management 3.0. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may have read it. Uh, there's some really good principles and, and thoughts in this reference. Um, and there are some exercises and things in the public domain around these concepts. But as it states here, creative workers should focus on trust first. Um, until you build the trust needed, you won't be able to promote the transparency that fosters open and honest conversation where creativity can thrive. And we need creativity to foster innovative thinking, breakthrough thinking, and the other you know, creative aspects of which Scrum can be such a great fit, such a great fit. So what were some of the things that, that happened here? Um, first off, um, the stakeholder group brought the entire set of scrum teams and the supporting players together for two weeks. They all flew in to the same physical location for a couple of weeks and met face to face. So proximity is really, really key here. Inter interpersonal relationships can be better built when everybody's in, in a room together, you have an opportunity to meet and shake hands. Um, they went out and did you know, some, a couple big dinners and events outside of the workplace. Uh, that started to open up the opportunity for people to feel a little more open in their conversations. It started building relationships, not only within the scrum teams themselves, but across those teams and between the teams and the leadership and the stakeholders within, within this organization. So face-to-face. As they were brought face to face, one of the first things they did is they were pro professionally facilitated through the crafting of a healthy working agreement. Um, and some of you, if you're already practicing Scrum now, you may already have a crafted working agreement for your Scrum team. If you do, that's wonderful. If you don't, you should craft one. Um, a working agreement is helps set the norms that drive the behaviors within that group. And we, we need to create a working agreement that promotes a culture of professional safety. And that's one where things like job titles and politics and criticism are left out of the room. And the things that are brought into the room are things like confidentiality and, and good practices for obtaining consensus and how to be respectful to each other and uh, how to promote openness and honesty within the groups of crafting that working agreement. And they did that uh, at the very, very beginning. Um, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about a very specific event that occurred when that working agreement was crafted. So having a good working agreement allows uh, people within that group to start building the trust to promote the transparency. And if any of those rules get broken, it promotes the conflict, the healthy conflict that's needed to call people out in a very respectful way. Hey, Johnny, we're violating you know, this norm that we've agreed on in our working agreement. We're still learning, so we decided that we would call each other out on these things. Um, and I saw that happen on a number of occasions as this group started to use uh, their newly crafted working agreements. Um, uh, just promoting transparency in their artifacts. Uh, one of the neat things they did, uh, kind of a very simple example, 
But while they were together for a couple of weeks, I came in one morning as the coach at 6 in the morning before anyone was there. And in one of the working rooms that they had had, they had an empty whiteboard uh, that they weren't using. Um, and so I just threw some sticky notes and markers uh, on the whiteboard and on the table when I left. And so when that group got together and did their daily scrum, uh, they ran their daily scrum uh, like usual. Um, they got, you know, they did it in their 15-minute time box. But as as their daily scrum wrapped up, uh, uh, the scrum product owner peeked uh, uh, her head in the room and said, "Hey, um, so great that we're all here, you know, face to face. I just wanted to say hi. I, was, I enjoyed seeing you all at dinner last night. Um, how'd your daily scrum go? What do you need from me?" Um, and uh, what's what's the plan for for meeting the sprint goal with the days that we have left in the sprint? How, how how can I help and what can you share? And it was very interesting behaviors because the, the scrum team they were they were still learning how to do this and they looked at a, at a blank wall and they actually looked at that product owner and said, um, you know what? Can we get with you in 15 minutes? Uh, we'd like to have a conversation with you about that. And she said, sure. And so she walked out of the room to go spend time with some other folks, and they swarmed that empty whiteboard right out of the blue. And they grabbed sticky notes, and they started having a true planning conversation about the sprints. First time they'd ever done it, for real. Really promoted transparent behavior in their daily scrum. And what was neat about that was, you know, they researched and, and added tools to their uh, their toolbox, and then they took that same very simple practice that a lot of us use in scrum teams and started behaving the same way back uh, in their globally distributed uh, locations. They just used an online tool to promote the planning conversation um, instead of a physical board. And it was very, very neat to see that breakthrough uh, with, with, with these scrum teams. Um, and then one, one other example was while they were all together face to face for those two weeks, uh, the leadership of the group said, you know what? We're all here together. We, we feel great relationships being built. It's all good stuff. Um, uh, everybody gets webcams, and everyone was, was really excited. Everybody got a nice high-definition web camera uh, to hook into their laptop and take back to wherever, wherever they, were, they were located and said, let's keep using these. We're leaders. We will use them with you all. Um, the face-to-face, -face, it means a lot to see all of you here. We're all in this together. Uh, let us know if this is helpful. And, and as they went back after this two-week you know, on site, um, I had a chance to observe one of the scrum team's daily scrums afterward, and, and they had started their daily scrum kind of in the same behaviors where uh, people are mute, it's kind of quiet, but then suddenly one of the developers pops up on a web camera. You know, person's in a sweatshirt. That's fine. Um, they, they didn't have a problem with that. Everyone was working from home. Uh, and that person said, hey, I'm on webcam. Is anybody else using their webcam? And next thing you know, three, four, five others start popping up on web camera. And they're looking at each other face to face. And, and a really interesting behavior that emerged around shared accountability finally started happening. One of the developers in that daily scrum was, was on mute, on web camera, typing. So imagine that person looking down at his or her keyboard. The other developers noticed it and very politely and respectfully called the person out. Um, hey, Johnny, Johnny, can you hear us? We know, we know you're there. We know you're on mute. And, and we're sure that whatever you're doing is, is very important. But our working agreement says that we will never use the mute button in our daily scrum. So we're just trying to politely call each other out on that. Uh, please take us off mute. We're all here together. It's only 15 minutes or less. We need to have a planning conversation. And because it was polite and respectful, it generated what we call a, very, a green zone behavior, very productive conflict with that developer and the rest of the group. And that developer responded very favorably to that, to that calling out. And it, it changed the way that group worked together across a globally distributed boundary. It's really fascinating to see it play out. So some of the things we talk about, and it comes back to Management 3.0, you, know, you look for examples of this as I spoke of uh, in that situation. When you look at building trust as a foundation for promoting transparency, there are four levels to be built. Uh, leadership has to trust the teams that are in the trenches. Um, the teams in the trenches have to trust their leadership. 
uh, within a single team, the members of that team have to start trusting each other. And then number four, also important, you have to trust yourself so that you feel comfortable being open and honest and vulnerable to promote uh, transparent conversations. So you look for great examples of this. Uh, one behavior I saw with this group, which was very interesting, was that one of the first meetings they had in their face-to-face -face was kind of a state of the union, a, an all hands on deck. And so all of them got together in a huge room, and, and, and the business person who ha headed up this entire practice area, responsible for the profit and loss for this entire complex set of products, got into a room, they had crafted a, a working agreement, had learned how to do that initially to promote transparent and trusting conversations. And, and that person, for the first time ever, made an emotional plea to everybody in the room. What showed, showed a moment of vulnerability and said, everybody, this is a crisis. We have brought you all here because we have a true business crisis, a true sense of urgency. If we don't figure out a way to put our heads together to create some value for our customers in an aggressive time to market situation, we're going to go out of business. And I don't want that to happen. We have such smart people here. We have a great idea. We're well positioned in the market, but I desperately need your help. And I'm willing to let my own guard down to do what I need to do as a leader to support you all. I know we haven't worked together well in the past. I'm open to, to, to recrafting the way we work together. And, and this person physically and emotionally put that plea on the table. And you could feel that galvanizing the group. It was really an amazing moment of courage and vulnerability by an executive leader. And it was done in a face-to-face -face setting. And it set the tone for that entire two-week on-site. It started building the trust between the teams in the trenches and the leadership within that organization. Just one example of that. Really amazing to see it play out. So think about these four levels of trust. Where are you in your own teams and in your own organization now around these four levels of trust? Uh, one example, as we looked at the retro retrospective earlier, the one that you know, was a bit more challenged, as, as we talked about, with the mute button as the tool and kind of the one-way conversation, well, one of the things that they, they did differently is they changed up uh, the format of their retrospective. Uh, it's a great book on the subject that I'll share at the end uh, called Agile Retrospectives. And so with a little bit of coaching and some facilitation, uh, they started running a more agile retrospective format across multiple scrum teams using multiple go-to meetings, multiple phone conference calls, online whiteboarding tools to try to emulate the face-to-face, -face, you know, rich interactions that they were having as they started having better retrospectives during that two-week uh, uh, um, on-site. And so, it, you know, the agenda looks something like this. I think it, you know, it varied as they inspected and adapted the format over time, but it was something like this. Um, but you're going to see some practices in here, and I'm going to show one that they introduced along the way that a lot of teams do do now that is very, very uh, powerful practice. Um, uh, but you can see it was done in a two-hour time box across multiple scrum teams, and it was quite effective. And here were some of the things that they did that started promoting transparency in their retrospectives. Um, the first was what we call a safety check. So this is an example of the results of an actual safety check from a scrum team um, as the journey proceeded and trust and transparency started to be built and promoted uh, within this larger group. So. In, in short, a safety check is, is at the beginning of a retrospective and the scrum team votes on a scale of zero to four, whatever you want your scale to be, how safe do you feel to be completely open and honest in this retrospective? Where zero means you feel afraid and you're basically going to stay on mute the whole time. Four is the opposite end of the spectrum, I feel completely safe in this environment. I will share anything and everything needed to help this be a very productive and valuable scrum event. 
as a retrospective. And the key is everybody votes anonymously, so you don't know who voted what. So this was an anonymous safety check uh, that was run in a face-to-face -face setting. And you know, all I did when I helped facilitate this for the group was walk around with blank sheets of paper, and folks wrote their number, in you know, under the table, and they just threw it in a hat, and then just kind of pulled the numbers out and chalked it off on the board. And uh, you know, two is neutral. So I don't feel completely vulnerable, but I don't feel 100% safe either. But if you were the scrum master, what would you do if this was the result of your safety check? Yeah, would you run the retrospective? Would you not? Would you continue? In this case, uh, this was considered safe enough to have a retrospective. In fact, when they got into the retrospective, some of the people that had voted neutral actually felt transparent enough to say that they had voted neutral. And, and that was pretty interesting to see. So then they would share reasons why, which helped promote some conversations in the retrospective. Pretty neat stuff. Um, as these teams started running retrospectives in a more agile way, some of them were still a little, a, a little challenged with the transparency aspects when they went back to their distributed locations. So they, you know, as we see a lot in organizational culture, behaviors will start to take hold, but if you don't really keep at it, uh, uh, previous behavior will will oftentimes take over, and that's what ties to you know challenged uh, change efforts. So in this situation, what they did was they used uh, this really neat online tool to start putting stickies on a board to help reflect on the timeline of a sprint. So this was each day, each column was a day for a sprint, and and. Um, Early as they got good at this, they would try to reflect on the whole sprint and build these stickies out um, during the retro. Then, as this practice took hold, they kept the board up all the time. And then during a sprint, as a, a meaningful event occurred, they would put a sticky on a board. That way it was very fresh. So it was really interesting to see this practice slowly but surely take hold with the group. So this is how they would storm, if you will, the, the notable events to be thinking about and talking about over you know this what two two and a half week sprint give or take, and then as they got into the idea of brainstorming for their retrospective, one of the things they did that promoted transparency was this tool allowed Scrum team members to put ideas on the board anonymously, and that was a really critical tool for them. So they ideas that they had been talking about in that private chat room. Uh, they've been talking about for months, um, and, and none of those ideas had come to fruition, but with this anonymity in place, all kinds of ideas that have been talked about for a long time started to become transparent um, to the Scrum Master, uh, to organizational leadership. Um, and this anonymous format even encouraged courage. At one point in one of these retrospectives, one of the developers who had been anonymous actually became non-anonymous and jumped in and said, hey, just so everyone knows, I, I put that one sticky up here about the user experience group. Uh, I, we, we've been talking about this for three months. Um, we need to bring a user experience skill set into the Scrum development team. What can we do to make that happen? And, and the person was not afraid to say that. And when that person showed that moment of courage in a safe environment, next thing you know, the whole Scrum team starts pointing out the stickies that each person had put on the board, promoted a ton of encouraging and inspiring transparent conversation with the group. So I, I hope that case study was helpful for you all. Um, uh, a, a lot of things they ran into along the way, and I think as you, as you reflect back and maybe look at some, you know, some recommended reading and references out there in the industry, I, three things that, that come to mind for me. Uh, the and I and our sorry, our iceberg is melting is a fable. It's a very short. Re, it reads like a child's book, but it's it's recommended reading for for a lot of executives in in Fortune 500 companies. Um, and it's a fable uh, that talks you through change and courage and the things that happen along the way to promote 
you know, these types of behaviors within a group so that they can make the changes they need to survive and thrive. A really good kind of almost like a children's story uh, that talks you through examples of the type of people that are involved and how change can be sparked. Um, Agile Retrospectives, great book. Uh, there are a lot of really good ideas in that book around practices you can use, icebreakers for retrospectives, how to build a good environment for facilitating a retrospective. And then Management 3.0, uh, there's really, really good um, just principles in there based on complex systems thinking and just a new generational way of looking at how to manage and lead organizations in a more agile way. A lot of, a lot of good stuff in there that, you know, of course, I drawled on around the, uh, the four you know, uh, uh, levels of trust to, to build from. So in summary, um, transparency. I, it's clearly essential uh, for a meaningful Agile journey. Um, so you have to look at healthy transparency and how you build the environments needed where people feel safe and trusted so that they can be transparent in how they behave, how they work together, um, et cetera. That's really key, building the trust to promote the transparency. And as you're looking at that in your own organizations, look at the four levels of trust that I talked about and start looking at building, or either if you already have it, galvanizing the trust on these four levels, including within your, yourself. So introspecting your own trust in yourself and the work and the things that you do in your organization. And then lastly, think about proximity. The value of face-to-face -face is so, so critical. The value of face-to-face. So I want to thank you. Um, really means a lot to everyone here today. Here's my contact information. Um, if there's anything I can help with, please reach out. Uh, you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. My email address is here. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my firm, the Madison Henry Group, we have a number of offerings uh, that we help clients with to realize the benefits of Agile, uh, including the services and the solutions you see here. Um, so if there's anything we can help with, please get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from you. And with that, I will hand it back out over to Ravi. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was uh, inspiring, thought-provoking, and also very practical. I appreciate all the concrete tips that you shared that people can start applying the moment they get off this webinar. Uh, so, folks, this is the time where you get a chance to get your questions answered by one of the world's leading Agile coaches. A couple of options. You can tweet your questions. Um, make sure to mention the handle scrum.org and the hashtag scrumpulse. And also you can type in your questions in the webinar chat window. Um, so Dan, one of the first questions that's come in is um, during the talk you mentioned that the teams created working agreements that help build trust and promote transparency. Um, in your experience, have you noticed any patterns of uh, in terms of characteristics of good and effective working agreements? I have. That is a very good question. Um, so uh, working agreements are as unique as the teams and the organizations that those working agreements serve. Um, the key to a good working agreement is cre using it to create an environment where people feel safe, to be open and honest in their conversations. I call that a safety culture, um, uh, uh, a culture of professional safety. So um, examples of good characteristics would be working agreements that have things like, we don't use job titles. Um, uh, you want to make sure that politics and criticism and biased thinking are kept out of the room, so what are some things you can craft in a working agreement to help promote that? Um, here, here's an example of a few things I've seen from some actual working agreements. Um, may may not be a good fit for your groups. Uh, one, keep all information confidential until the group decides what they will do with the outcome. Uh, that's a pretty standard statement in organizations where they want to promote a lot of transparency in an event. So if folks know that what they're going to be, what they're going to talk about, isn't just going to be sent all over email after the meeting. 
and they know it'll be confidential, and they get to decide how the information is used. That can that can promote um, transparency within the group. Um, a, a really key one that a lot of people I think see now is, you know, discuss and point a finger at the issue or the problem or the or the idea. Don't point a finger at the person or the personality. That helps, you know, remove blaming and backbiting and some of what we call red zone behaviors within groups that, that don't have trust or where trust has been eroded. Um, uh, I saw one once that said, compliment a person every 15 minutes. I thought that was kind of neat. That was with a, a newly formed scrum team with people that had really not worked together before. So it was kind of a playful norm that they had included in their working agreement. Um, uh, one example, one that's interesting is don't try to get the last word in. Um, I, that, that was actually part of one of the working agreements with the case study I shared because when trust was not there, it seemed like as I was observing the group, each person always wanted to get the last word in because they were afraid that if they didn't bring the better idea t uh, to bear that they might get fired. Um, or, or something might get punished or something bad would happen. So everybody was stepping on everybody else to try to get their idea and last. Hey, Johnny, that was a great idea, but, um, but you know, I, I think we could do this. Um, or, you know, I, I, I think we should look at this idea. That's, that's not uh, um, the types of behaviors that promote collaboration. Um, uh, kind of more of a negative type of behavioral element. So they needed to change behavior. They wrote a very specific term in their working agreement. Don't, you don't have to be the last person to get a word in. If you're going to add something, start with, and they quoted this, to add to Johnny's idea, dot, dot, dot. And they had to, they had to like forcefully practice that behavior. But once they did, it really took off. Um, and then the no mute button one. Remember, I mentioned that during the talk itself. They uh, some of their daily scrum working agreements said no mute button. We don't care if you're working from home um, and the dog starts starts barking. That's fine. We want to know that that distraction exists so we can talk to you about it. Things like that. So there's some examples of some things that that have been in actual working agreements that have promoted transparency. Sounds good. Good good tips. We have more questions than we have time, so we may not be able to get to all the questions, but uh, we might have time for one quick question here. So, uh, Dan, I've, uh, I've been in situations where there, has, there is lingering distrust because of, you know, many years, in some cases, decades of hostility. So, let's say somebody is, uh, try, ha, finds themselves in this situation and they they notice some behavior where somebody is taking is being courageous and they are promoting transparency and in a trusting culture do you have any techniques you can share for rewarding those kind of courageous people who are leading the charge that is a good question about rewarding you know how do you reward trust and transparency um, uh, Jeff Sutherland actually talks about it in his book that was released today. He has a very pragmatic statement. Um, I just got the book today, so I can't remember the exact sentence, but you know, it was something about uh, don't, don't necessarily use exercises to build trust. Um, you just got to practice trust every day, and I'm a big believer in that. Um, but rewarding transparent and trusting behaviors, there are ways of doing this um, that, that can be effective, and I'll share some things that, that have worked for me. Um, uh, the two things to think about are two types of motivation. Extrinsic motivation, which is where uh, you're trying to drive behavior using external rewards, like, um, okay, uh, we'll give everybody uh, a bonus if you'll just be open and transparent. That's trying to use a reward to drive the desired behavior. Oftentimes, that is not an effective way of rewarding uh, in, when applying that to complex creative work. And that's been shown in multiple settings. We, a lot of us have talked about Daniel Pink's work and Drive, and so we're, we're all very aware of that here in, in the Agile space. But intrinsic motivation is a little bit different, and this is where you, you use a, a different type of reward scheme to help trigger the behavior within the person. 
So the person almost rewards him or herself by doing something for someone else. Um, an example of something, a technique that you can use is, uh, this is a very specific example. So, so I used this once with a team, it was very effective, where um, uh, they came into uh, a retrospective, they were trying to use Scrum, there had been a lot of lingering distrust, it was in a very challenging organizational culture, but what we were trying to do was create a culture, a subculture within this group to start developing it so the larger organization could see what does a, a culture of agility really look like and how can we start promoting that across the organization. So what we did was, when they went to their, their retrospective, rather than rewarding people and teams for the outcome of the work, each person actually had in their pocket just a very small, simple $10 stop Starbucks card. You know, they all had Starbucks. In general, people liked various drinks and stuff from Starbucks. So each person specifically made a statement about someone else on the team, a behavior of that team that, that that showed trust, transparency, and, and agile principles, and how it inspired that person. And, and that person would make a statement and gave the person uh, a Starbucks card and said, you have inspired me to, to be more open and honest, uh, to show the courage needed to develop this subculture. Uh, thank you for helping me learn how to be better at what I do. Uh, here's a Starbucks card from me. And they went, and the peers within that group rewarded each other. Uh, but the key is they weren't giving each other $1,000 you know, gift cards. They were just doing really small, simple rewards, like a little Starbucks card or you know, just something meaningful that resonated with that group. So that it's, the, the card is not the point. The point is the intrinsic motivation that peer-level uh, rewarding in a public setting did to help start working on that lingering long-term culture of distrust. So that's one example uh, that I've seen that worked very, very well, very, very well. Very good. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. So let's start wrapping up. Uh, for those whose questions did not get answered, I apologize, but I hope that you will continue the conversation either by talking directly to Dan or by participating in our free community scrum.org discussion groups where you can post your questions and get feedback from the larger community. Before we wrap up, I'd like to tell you a little bit about scrum.org. We are a mission-driven company. Our mission is to improve the profession of software development. We have a community of 120 experts worldwide. And we accomplish our mission through our thought leadership, our professional scrum courses, assessments, coaching, and our consulting. And we would love for you to join us. Um, we, we welcome like-minded people to partner with us. Uh, you can join our community of practitioners, uh, and you can learn more at scrum.org. So uh, with that, we uh, come to the end of our Scrum Pulse session. I want to thank you all. And I also want to get your feedback on this session and what topics you would like for our next session. Um, you can share your feedback by suggesting topics at our Scrum Pulse page. Uh, and if you want, you can also tweet your ideas. Make sure that you use the handle scrum.org and the hashtag Scrum Pulse. So with that, I want to thank all of you for your engaged participation and your questions. And I want to thank Dan for uh, your inspiring talk. So hope to see you again next month. And with that, uh, have a great day, great evening, and a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye.